Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this event in support of um, Congresswoman Susan Wild. My name is Jill Zippin. I am here with Dana Gordon and Haley Stoifer. Dana is the Dana of Politics with Dana and Steve. They do events like this to support Democratic candidates around the country, and they are based in Chicago. Haley Stoifer, who many of you know, is the CEO of Jewish Democratic Council of America, the only national Jewish Democratic political organization in the nation, and it too supports candidates like Susan Wilde. Democratic Jewish Outreach Pennsylvania is a proud affiliate of JDCA, and we are the only Jewish Democratic PAC in the state of Pennsylvania. As I said, we are here tonight in support of Congressman Susan Wilde, who represents PA7. It is a tough district. She won her last race by three percentage points. She is a purple district, as we say, and a frontline candidate. Congressman Wilde has been a member of the Lehigh Valley community, for those of you who don't know her, for more than 30 years, and her two adult children were born and raised there. In November of 2018, she was elected the first woman to represent Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District. She serves on the Education, Labor, and Foreign Affairs Committee, and she is Pennsylvania's only Jewish federally elected office holder. As I said at the outset, we are here tonight to be a part of politics with Dana and Steve, Steve being Steve Sheffy. Steve is unable to be here with us tonight. As many of you know, very sadly, his daughter took her own life this weekend. Haley generously agreed to fill in. Suicide is an issue that Congressman Wild cares deeply about. She introduced in 2021, the Enhancing Mental Health and Suicide Through Campus Planning Act. So we will begin with Susan, Susan speaking about this important health issue and her personal connection to it. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you, Hallie, for filling in. And my, I just have to express to everybody here my deep sadness, as I know we are all feeling for Steve and his family. Um, suicide has touched my family personally, and I know um, all too well how devastating um, it is much more, or I shouldn't say much more so, but in a completely different way than just death of a family member. It's a completely different um, experience and emotion, but I've never had to deal with loss of a child to suicide. And I, so I will be reaching out to Steve. I wanna give him a little bit of time and space, but I'm just incredibly, Grateful for him for having organized this initially. I met Steve, uh, met quote unquote, uh, because I, like many of you, I receive his online newsletter. And as you may know, he occasionally will put out, you know, a very soft ask for financial help, you know, just getting it out and that kind of thing. And I sent a relatively modest contribution a couple of years ago, and he immediately responded by email to me. And then we've just had this dialogue going ever since. And he's really been a friend and has actually helped me with a lot of issues having to do with Israel and anti-Semitism when I just need somebody to bounce ideas off. So, um, but I'm very, very sorry and upset for him and his family. So um, as Jill referenced, I, I care deeply about this issue. Um, I care deeply about mental health coverage in general. It was not what I set out to be involved in when I went to Congress. I honestly, it, yeah, there were a lot of things that I had on my list of priorities. Mental health wasn't really, you know, something that I was thinking about actively. And then five months into my time in Congress, my life partner died by suicide. And I often say um, that you follow the path that life leads you on. And that path led me to really care deeply about the mental health crisis that we are having in this country, even before COVID. And now, of course, we know just how extreme it has become. And the statistics are terrifying. Um, I have been very, very involved with some initiatives, including most recently um, working or trying to persuade YouTube to remove how to tie a noose videos from their platform. They have multiple how to tie a noose videos 
Um, st it, that issue was brought to me by an adolescent psychologist. And I have since learned that there, is, uh, there are a lot of differences in the manner in which people plan a suicide and that adolescents in particular and young people are much more likely to commit the act on a very spontaneous basis and without a whole lot of forethought, whereas older people often tend to plan it for months or even years in advance. So the fact of being having these hideous videos um, on YouTube, and by the way, um, of adolescent suicides, uh, two thirds of them are by hanging in this country. So it's, it's a very re relevant issue. I've been reaching out to YouTube and, and talking to them about this for since um, 2020. Um, and I'm, I have stepped up the pressure uh, considerably, going very, very public on this, because I think it's inexcusable. Anyway, but there are other things um, that we are working on, into, including making sure that we, are, that we have mental health coverage parity between physical health and mental health. Um, we're supposed to under the Affordable Care Act, but as most of you may, or as many of you may know, um, the, the kind of coverage that most people's insurance plans have for therapist visits and that kind of thing are inadequate. And um, the other big problem we have, quite honestly, is a lack of supply of mental health care professionals. We've done, I think, a pretty tremendous job in the last decade of reducing the stigma around talking about mental health care coverage, about um, uh, people feeling more like they are able to express their needs um, for mental health coverage. But the fact of the matter is we simply do not have enough providers. I live, my district up in the Lehigh Valley, the biggest shortage we have in this area is adolescent psychologists and adolescent beds in, in you know, uh, hospital settings. For, and so I'm a member of the House Education and Labor Committee, and one of the things I've been very active in is trying to work on incentives to get people to go into that field. I mean, think about it. Student loan debt is a huge issue for people, but mental health doesn't really pay a whole lot of money. We're going into social work or even psychology, especially with insurance reimbursements being what they are, is not particularly lucrative. And if you can you know, get a degree in something technical, then chances are you're gonna make a whole lot more money. So we've got to figure out financially how we're going to incentivize people to go into the field because if you, it's great to reduce the stigma, but if people can't find a provider, you haven't done much. And then the most, the, the, one more thing you're gonna see this year is a national suicide hotline, which is being implemented very shortly. The number will be 988 and that will be rolled out um, by the FCC is, is working on getting that rolled out now. So that's all I'll say on that right now, Jill, but I'm happy to answer questions later about that. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Dana Gordon, who's gonna ask you some domestic policy issues to be followed up by Haley, who's gonna discuss um, anti-Semitism, Israel, Iron Dome. So why don't we start with you, Dana? Hi, Congresswoman. Um, I wanna say, I'm so sorry for your loss. And on behalf of Steve, I wanna thank you for the work you are doing on mental health. And maybe we could save the next girl's life who's in college and reaches out for help. And maybe next time someone will be there to answer her call. Um, many of us who are not from Pennsylvania really became acquainted with you on January 6th when the insurrectionists were at the door and Jason Crow was on top of you. Um, it was a terrible day. We all felt your anguish. It was as if we were laying on that floor. And we want to know, like now that the that the people that you're working with in Congress and the RNC called January 6th legitimate political discourse, how do you go on? What do you say about that? And how do you deal with your friends across the aisle? You know. In many ways, I have compartmentalized January 6th from the rest of what I see as the dysfunction on the other side of the aisle. And part of it's just self-preservation. It's very hard as somebody who was in the house gallery, hearing bullets, hearing breaking glass, hearing pounding on the doors, knowing that people were trying to get in to get to us and being just a few feet away from them. It's very hard to 
we hear people minimize it. And all of you know and remember that within the couple of days after January 6th, everybody, including Kevin McCarthy, was decrying what had happened. And then it just switched on a dime and it suddenly became a no big deal. Oh, it was kind of an ordinary tourist day, which of course is ridiculous because we hadn't had tourists in the building at that point for almost a year because of COVID. And it's very hard to hear it. Um, it the most recent, the legitimate political discourse comment, quite honestly, is one that is so ludicrous that I think it may actually change some minds around the country. People who really didn't see Jan or thought the Democrats were making too big a deal out of January 6th, but they recognized that this was not legitimate political discourse. I mean, we lost five lives. Two people, two police officers committed suicide shortly after this ha happened and they had been on duty. Um, one police officer died because of the injuries he sustained. Um, and there were two other people who died, you know, to call this legitimate political discourse is absurd. And quite frankly, is just a continuation of this problem that we have in this country of minimizing these horrors. And I'm not even, I'm not talking about January 6th. I'm talking about the horrors of, you know, peaceful protest um, being attacked, uh, the Charlottesville, uh, you know, riots. Um, we've seen it, every, the attacks on synagogues and, and other houses of worship. All of this is part of the same problem. And so um, it's, it, it, quite honestly, I, I don't spend a lot of time talking about January 6th unless I'm asked about it because I'm kind of amazed by how means what I consider to be mainstream people who are Republicans think that we are exaggerating the enormity of that day. I can tell you that as a result of that day, those of us who were stuck in the gallery had to form a support group and get group therapy, which we had to do by Zoom because of COVID. We still get together periodically. We are, we are stronger for it. We have made these unbelievable friendships and have unbelievable bonds. But it, it, you know, and by the way, that picture of me lying on the floor was done right after I, I was FaceTiming with my two adult kids. And I ended the FaceTime call and just felt this sense of abject panic because I could see the worry in, in my kids' faces. I heard their words that they, you know, didn't believe me that I was going to be okay. And for a parent that there's nothing more excruciating than feeling like you are causing your children pain, even if it's nothing that you could be blamed for. And I just had a complete and utter panic attack right after that phone call and a reporter caught me in that position. So, and Jason Crow was, it wasn't as a complete prince is all I can say. And is a very, very dear friend. We're glad that he was there and we're glad so, that he was Well, let me just tell you, he was out of the gallery and circled back to make sure he brought up the end of the group. And a lot of that was his training as an army ranger. And he just stepped up in a way that, I mean, I just feel lucky that he was there. He was prepared to do battle if he had to. Um, so anyway. You had a good person protecting you. Yeah. So the people on this call were the ones that care about the core issues, environment, women's reproductive rights, voting rights, especially. How do we let other Democrats know that these issues are really important and not the things that they see on the news every night, like CRT and who's on sports teams and who's using what bathrooms? and the things that seem to make the news because they're sensationalized? Well, it sounds simplistic, but it's really not. I try to remind people that all change has happened relatively incrementally in this country and around the world. Um, if you go back to the controversy over smoking inside and smoking on airplanes, I mean, that really all changed as a result of public demand for it. Um, in those days, of course, we listened to public health officials who told us that that was really bad. And now, you know, it, that's another whole story. 
Um, but people need to continue to talk about it. They need to continue to push back. They need to go to school board meetings and push back against all of this chatter about CRT. Quite honestly, those of us who are politicians, especially those of us in the tough districts, have to, we have to walk a fine line. If I am in a town hall and somebody asks me, you know, or claims that they are teaching CRT in the schools in my district, if my first response is no, they're not, which they aren't, I will immediately lose credibility with that portion of the audience that believes that they are. And so we as elected officials have to have very nuanced answers, we have, but we also have to be very respectful to the person asking the question. If they're parents, we have to make sure that they feel like they've been validated in their concerns about their children, even if I don't agree even one iota with their position. So it, re it requires those around us, people, like, people who are really engaged, who are not elected officials to speak the truth. Um, I'm not saying we don't speak the truth. It's just that we always have to be nuanced on these things. So to the extent that people can write letters to the editor, to the extent that people can go to school board meetings and stand up and, and speak, to, to the extent that you can talk to your own neighbors. Now, some of you live in neighbor, neighborhoods where you don't have to worry about that because all of your neighbors are of like mind, but not everybody is that way. Um, and we've got to meet people where they are and we have, to, we have to talk about the truth and we have to really, that for the people who aren't as vocal about it, you know, for the, all the people that get up on school board meetings and talk about CRT, there's a vast majority of parents who aren't even thinking about CRT, but we need to make sure that they understand that this is, you know, a false threat, that this is, you know, a false flag, so to speak. And, and, um, and then finally, you, you know, you mentioned voting rights. You've got to demand that every single person that asks you for your vote at the federal or state level is committed to upholding your unfettered right to vote. And not just yours, but everybody in the community who legally has the right to vote. Um, and if they won't, and same thing, you know, with abortion rights, if you don't get a full throated, clear answer, then demand better answers and find out where the hesitation is. And abortion rights is one where we see it an awful lot where people kind of hedge on, you know, I don't personally believe in it, but I would uphold it. You know, what does that look like? If you're a man who doesn't personally believe in abortion, but you would uphold a woman's right to choose, you know, ask them, what do you mean by that? What, what extent are you willing to go to? Um, would you ever support any limit, you know, would you ever support any government interference with a woman's right to choose? Or, you know, government being in her doctor's office with her and her doctor. So it, it's a matter of unfortunately being fairly demanding and making it clear that people will not get your vote unless they, you know exactly where they are and then holding them accountable. And I will tell you, one of the things, I, as somebody who is an elected official, for me, it is very powerful if I hear from my constituents and they express any kind of dissatisfaction with something that I might've promised that they feel like I'm not upholding or that they want me to explain why I voted a certain way when they thought I was gonna vote a different way. That's powerful stuff because, and more so than having people from around the country contact me because of course the people you're ultimately accountable to are your own constituents. So with your own, whoever your elected officials are, be demanding and make sure that they are holding their end of the bar bargain up. I have one more domestic issue before we get to Haley. There was, there's now talk about part two of Build Back Better being broken down into smaller pieces of legislation they can maybe pass the House and the Senate. Do you agree with this strategy? And which pieces of this legislation would you like to see brought up first and have the best chance of success? So many of you probably already know this, but if we don't, if we're doing a bill and we're not doing it in the reconciliation process, which you probably, if you're doing it through reconciliation and that, by the way, you can't just decide one day you're gonna do a bill through reconciliation, but if you, there's all kinds of things you have to go through. A reconciliation bill only needs 50 votes. 
in the Senate. So that means right now with Kamala Harris's tie-breaking vote, we have 50 votes, which is why we were trying to get Build Back Better through on reconciliation until we found out that Mansion and Cinema and possibly others were gonna get in the way of that. So if you want to introduce parts of the Build Back Better Act individually as standalone bills, you need 60 votes, which means you need 10 Republicans to come over. So what I have been advocating, my number one issue right now out of the Build Back Better Act is prescription drug pricing. I thought we were finally going to have a situation where Medicare could negotiate with pharmaceutical companies and bring down the price of drugs, not only for Medicare recipients, but also for the rest of us, because as the prices go down for Medicare, they go down across the board. And lo and behold, um, and by the way, the, you probably know this, the VA is allowed to negotiate with pharma and yet Medicare is not. And Medicare is the single largest consumer of prescription drugs anywhere in the world. It's US taxpayers who are paying for the fact that we cannot negotiate those prices. I thought for sure we were finally gonna get that done. And then of course, build back better fell apart for other reasons. Now we do have the promise of Manchin and Cinema and a couple of other more conservative Democrats that they would vote for those prescription drug pricing provisions, but that still would mean we need 10 Republicans. And we have so far don't have a single Republican on record as saying that they would support um, any kind of Medicare negotiation, which is appalling. Um, so there's there's that aspect to it. But keep in mind that anything that we break down into a standalone bill is going to need 60 votes. So what does that leave us with where we can get 10 Republicans? Not a whole lot. I mean, I'm I, I tend to I try to be very transparent with people. You, you, there are still people in Congress in leadership who will talk about build back better and we're going to get it done and we're going to get it through. And I don't make those kinds of promises because I don't see a path forward for the Build Back Better Act. The question becomes, is there some smaller version of it that we can get through on reconciliation, not on standalone bills? There are very few standalone bills that, that would come out of Build Back Better that we could get 60 votes for. I'm not sure there are any. And so that means still coming up with a reconciliation package that Manchin and Cinema and Menendez and others would vote for. And that's what we're working on right now. And by the way, there are one or two things that we could probably, for instance, capping insulin prices at $35 a month is probably something we could do on a standalone basis. And I was all set to move forward that way. I will tell you, I heard from a lot of advocacy groups like AARP and uh, a group called Lower Drug Prices Now, they don't want that to happen on a single issue basis because they're concerned that if we do something like reduce the insulin prices, that there will be this feeling in Washington of, oh, we got something dug, done on prescription drug prices. And then that will be the end of prescription drug pricing for another decade. And I see, I completely see their point. The other thing is that should be the easiest part, that $35 a month cap, because insulin is costs nothing to make. It's the formula has been around for decades and there's no legitimate reason for this crazy pricing that they have for it. Um, but it, it's almost like that's, you all know the term loss leader. It's not a loss leader, but it's kind of, like, it's the easy part of a prescription drug bill. So we don't want to give it away as a standalone bill and then lose that incentive. Because I will tell you that if we don't get a drug pricing bill done and, and we are blaming it right smack on the GOP that we're not getting it done, I think there will be payback. The reason we had a blue wave in 2018, aside from the Trump effect, was that people were terrified that coverage for pre-existing conditions were gonna be taken away. And at this point, nobody really thinks the ACA will ever get repealed. So nobody's this worried about that. Now, I, when I say nobody thinks that it will ever, I think the average American doesn't. I think it's, if the Republicans take back the house, they're gonna do everything they can to get rid of Obamacare. Um, but my point being, we've got to create the momentum on drug pricing to make sure that, it, um, that, that the public is demanding it. And that includes of their GOP senators. Thank you. Haley? 
Thank you so much. And I, uh, I apologize if you see eight year olds in the background. Uh, I want to, I want to thank you, Dana, for, for hosting this incredible event. I want to thank you, Jill, and the Democratic Jewish Outreach of Pennsylvania. Um, and I want to thank you, Congresswoman, for, for your voice, for your leadership, and for your message of support for our friend, Steve. Uh, we are all thinking of him. Um, we want to also talk about foreign policy, uh, which is uh, a passion of Steve. So he would normally be playing and this mine. role. <laughs> yes. And I know you serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, starting with uh, looking specifically through foreign policy, through uh, the lens of your Jewish values, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, you're the only Jewish elected official to federal office in Pennsylvania. How do your Jewish values impact your work? And have you experienced, whether personally or in your district, the rise of right-wing extremism and anti-Semitism? And what more can Congress do to combat this incredibly dangerous scourge? Well, thanks for the question. It's um, a challenging question. I will tell you that, you know, as all of you know, your Judaism is just in a part of you. And so you take it with you everywhere you go. And I certainly take it with me to Congress. And I view so many foreign policy issues and so many things having to do, for instance, with human rights abuses around the world through the perspective of not only being a Jew, but having uh, being a Jewish mother of um, young adults in their 20s, being concerned about their future and anti-Semitism and my grandchildren, hopefully someday, uh, everybody, you know, say a little prayer for me, Susan, to have grandchildren someday. And um, so it it's just something you carry with you all the time, as you know, but it really does put a whole different perspective on the plight of some people around the world, not Jews, but for instance, the Uyghur Muslims in China. I had a couple of constituents come to me early on um, in my term before I had ever even heard of the Uyghur Muslims and tell me about the atrocities that were happening in China. And they brought in a portfolio with pictures of their parents who were, were, were being held at the time and unfortunately have probably since passed away in, in one of these detention camps. And any informed Jew can't help but view any kind of human rights abuses in the context of the Holocaust and that it happened to our own people. And that I think there is a certain amount of privilege that people have when they haven't really gone through struggles as a, as a collective people. And so, it's always with me. I'm always thinking about it, whether I'm thinking about anti-Semitism, whether I'm thinking about human rights abuses, whether I'm thinking about Israel specifically, um, it is with me. And it, you know, as you know, I mean, Jews aren't a monolithic group either. You know, it's like saying all whites vote one way, you know, all Jews don't vote the same way. We don't all hold the same perspective, but there are certain things that we absolutely mostly all hold near and dear to our heart, um, you know, the state of Israel, the, uh, the, the scourge, scourge of anti-Semitism, the horrors that we have seen in houses of worship. And um, you just, it, all I can tell you is that it's, it, that it is something that, and we have a fairly decent sized Jewish caucus. It's not really, a, we don't have an official caucus, but we kind of think of it as one. And I think we have 27 Jews who serve in Congress, which is a pretty small percentage of 435 members. Um, but we have a lot, there's a lot of solidarity and we have regular meetings and um, we talk about things that aren't just Jewish issues or Israel issues. And it's, um, it's almost a, an unexplainable kind of thing. It's just something you carry with you and it, it you, um, it's always there. On the issue of Israel, uh, it is uh, 
an interesting week for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that Speaker Pelosi uh, traveled to Israel on her way to the Munich Security Conference with a delegation of, I think, six other Democrats and sent a very strong message of support of Israel, which she indicated should remain bipartisan. This is always has been the approach until the last administration, which heavily politicized U.S. policy toward Israel. How um, how do you approach this issue when politics uh, can get in the way in terms of support of Israel, or what, how do you confront um, you know these Republican these false Republican questions about Democrats' support of Israel? What do you say to the critics? So let me just say um, it's not just with these false Republican claims. I have on occasion had members of the progressive caucus that I've had that I've talked to about issues pertaining to Israel. I, I really believe in their case, let's just talk about the progressives right now. For one instance, there were several, I think nine who voted against the Iron Dome funding. Um, I think a lot of it comes from not knowing enough about Israel. I think trips to Israel that are conducted by both J Street and, and uh, APAC um, are really important. I went in 2019. I had been many times to Israel, but I was with my colleagues, many of whom had never been to Israel, had no idea of the size and its proximity to countries that want to do harm to Israel. And so I think it's really important that those of us who without being at all um, condescending about it, that those of us who have a lot more knowledge um, about Israel issues, um, take a leadership role and talk to our friends and colleagues. Now with the people across the aisle, um, you know, you probably know that the Iron Dome funding is being held up in the Senate. It's mind boggling. It's not being held out, up by Democrats. And by the way, when I was running in 2018, there was a distinct concern among many in the Jewish community and certainly many in the pro-Israel community that they were losing Democrats from, you know, the Democrats weren't, were shying away from being pro-Israel. What we have seen since 2018 is exactly the opposite, but it's done in this, this way that Trump basically gave permission for. Um, Personally, I think pulling out of the JCPOA was about the most devastating thing he could have done. Uh, I was, there were plenty of Jews in the US who thought that that was the right thing to do and probably still think it's the right thing to do. But the fact of the matter is, it, we're in a more dangerous, or Israel's in a more dangerous situation now than they were at the time that, uh, back in 2018, when the, they were pulled out of the deal. Um, I, I think we have to hold people accountable. And I will tell you, First and foremost, we need to hold um, Leader Schumer accountable. Um, I think he has the best interests of Israel at heart, but he hasn't been strong enough on this Iron Dome funding issue. He allowed the Senate to adjourn for 10 days after when Rand Paul and Bernie Sanders were objecting to putting the Iron Dome funding that had already passed through the House. We're objecting to putting it to a vote. He should have insisted. He has the power to make it to vote on it. Um, so that was very disappointing. Um, and we also have to make sure that people aren't attaching issues like Iron Dome funding to other bills or other causes that they care about. Rand Paul in particular wants to take money out of the Afghanistan assistance funding and use that towards the Iron Dome funding. Of course, if you do that, you're gonna lose a whole lot of other members of Congress who don't wanna take money out of the Afghanistan. I mean, we really have to, Israel deserves to be a single issue that is dealt with in both houses in Congress. Um, I firmly believe that because the issues are so delicate and so challenging and we can't tie anything to, to any other issue. So um, I don't know, I, I, I might've lost track of the question. I'm Anti sorry. Anti-Semitism also, I think the question itself had a few pieces, but one of them was about the issue of rising anti-Semitism and whether you've experienced it personally, whether this has uh, happened in your district in terms of targeting of whether it's Jewish institutions or um, just whether you're experiencing this. So the answer is no, we have not had any specific 
um, acts. Although, well, I shouldn't say that we have had schools that have had a swastika um, painted on the side. That obviously is a, a hate crime and an act of anti-Semitism, but we thankfully haven't had any real violence that has occurred. I hate to say yet, but I will say it. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you have attacks in synagogues, we all feel it, whether it's in Pittsburgh or, you know, Ohio or anywhere else, we all feel it. We all feel the fear. Um, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. My perception is that a lot of people, a lot of the American public doesn't really believe that Jews are at any kind of risk in this country and that, you know, the, the Holocaust is over and happened, but you know, nothing like that will ever happen again, they say. And the anti-Semitism isn't real. Um, I'm doing, I actually am working on an editorial right now that I'm submit, I'll be submitting next week on anti-Semitism generally. Um, it, it's an issue, but it, it's so tied to so many other things. You know, the fact of the matter is, you know, there, there are plenty of, um, even I'll even say white supremacists, but certainly plenty of people in the GOP who pledge allegiance to Israel and yet are anti-Semitic. And um, I don't, I don't think we can ever assume that just because a Republican says, you know, that we need to, we all need to be Israel's best friend, that they don't harbor anti-Semitic thoughts. But it's all part and parcel of Islamophobia anti-Semitism and every other kind of, you know, uh, phobia or hate based on nationality and religion and that kind of thing. Tip, generally speaking, you know, somebody who hates one group of people is likely to hate Jews too, or at least feel resentful or feel, you know, all the tropes that we've all heard about Jews. And um, we just have to be very, very vigilant and very outspoken. I when I was running in 2018, was counseled by a fellow that I think thought he was being very well-meaning, a Democrat who he knew I was going canvassing in a, his part of the community. And at the time I was, when I, I was talking to him and I was wearing a Star of David and he said, you know, when you come to that neighborhood, you probably shouldn't like tell them you're Jewish. And, you know, I, I tried to explain to him nicely that, um, that in itself is an anti-Semitic suggestion. I know he thought he was being helpful, but you know, for, for me to not talk about being Jewish um, is you know, hiding my identity and nobody should have to do that. So I, I talk about it regularly. I talk about the fear that I had on 9-11 when I was in a courthouse when the planes hit. My kids were at the JCC in kindergarten and preschool. And this feeling of terror that the next thing to be targeted was going to be, you know, synagogues and JCCs and that kind of thing and racing out of the courthouse and going to pick up my kids. And by the way, a whole bunch of other kids whose parents along the way I contacted. Um, it, it's just, I don't think we can ever take it for granted that it's not there. I think we should take it for granted that it is there. And then we need to really do our best to own our, our, our Jewishness and um, talk about it and just be very, very vigilant about it. We have a question from uh, Edward and Esther Beck uh, about your Republican opponent, who mm -hmm. it's their understanding that uh, your opponent is also Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, how do you differ from her with respect to your assessment of the US Israel relationship? But I would just say generally also, just in, in general, if you want to tell us a little bit about your race. Okay. So mm -hmm. let me just start with the person that you're referring to is um, Lisa Scheller. She ran against me last time around. She is Jewish. Um, she her family, I should say, has, by, by the way, Pennsylvania 7, where I'm from, does not have a particularly large Jewish population. So the, the idea of two Jewish women running against each other is truly unusual in that district. Last, last cycle, 
I think it was Jewish Forward, but I'm not positive, did a whole article on these two Jewish women running against each other, um, you know, in Pennsylvania and in, in this district. But anyway, um, I don't, you know, I don't think either, she attacks me regularly for not being pro-Israel enough. Um, if I talk about anything that deviates from, quite frankly, a hard line pro-Israel talking point, she will attack me for being, you know, that's just it's her, that, but that's typical of her. She's a very negative person and has never really had any positive policy ideas, quite honestly. Um, the race last time, in 2018, I won by 10 points. In 2020, I won by three and a half points. Um, she spent a lot of her own money. She's a multimillionaire, has the ability to completely self-fund the race. She spent a lot of money last cycle. And, you know, it wasn't a great cycle overall for Democrats, um, but my, my, my margin should not have gone from 10 to three and a half. And it, I think it's mostly because of the amount of money she spent, but remember it was also COVID, we weren't knocking doors and that kind of thing. So there were probably a lot of factors. Um, she, but she, what notably last time she stopped spending money towards the end, because if you recall, all of the polls everywhere were completely wrong last year. So all of public polls had me up by 10 points again. Um, quite honestly, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee uh, pulled out of my race because they felt like I was safe and they didn't, I, they didn't need to help me anymore. They took a lot of money away from um, my campaign. And she stopped spending money, I think because she figured it was a foregone conclusion that I was going to win. So why waste any more of her money? She has pledged this time around that she will not stop spending. So we're anticipating that she will spend multiple millions of do dollars of her own money. And once she gets past the primary, she does have a primary. I don't think it's a very serious primary because the, the two fellows, one hasn't raised any money and one has been in for months now and has raised very, very little. So I think she will be my opponent. But as soon as she gets through that primary, I expect that the national GOP will be pouring money in because they, I am very much uh, one of their targets. So as I said, she, she runs a very nasty campaign. There's, it's not about her ideas and her policies about what will make our community better. It's about everything that's awful and terrible about me. And so that's just, I, I developed a fairly thick skin, fortunately, but it's still no fun. Okay, well, I think Ali asked a very important question, uh, which is, what can we all do to help amid this uh, heavily uh, spending campaign? Sounds like it's going to be expensive. Uh, so in addition to, to donating, what can we do to be helpful? Well, one of the things as we move forward, I, the good news is I have a wonderful campaign manager. I have a wonderful field organizer. I actually have several field organ organizers, including a Latino outreach organizer, which is important because my district it has a very large Hispanic population, um, at least relatively speaking. It's, it's pretty significant and they're very engaged. Um, we will be actively asking people to who are in safer districts where they don't really need to go knock doors for their local candidate because they're in a safe district to come and help us with volunteering um, and making sure that you know, we are getting, we are reaching every single person we can. Um, I also always need validators, people who um, are willing to either speak to a group, whether it be the local federation or other groups uh, about me um, and are willing to, you know, attest to my, my, um, my qualities and my, my credentials. But mostly what we will need a lot of volunteers. In 2018, we were incredibly fortunate to have people coming in from Connecticut and, Penn and uh, New Jersey and New York and Maryland. Literally thousands of people came in and volunteered and it was amazing. And we need that same kind of presence because obviously this is going to be a very, very difficult election year. I see that Daniel has put in the chat box, um, Emily Curtis's information. She is our 
principal organizer and the person who is collecting names and please reach out to her if you're and it doesn't you we either need people to come into our district and help us with knocking doors or if that's not your thing postcards and phone calls from your own home is also a really helpful thing Well, I can keep asking here. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll just keep going. Lisa has a great question um, about how how Democrats will break through the GOP wall intended to stop any Democratic progress. And I would note this is really happening in the Senate, uh, similar to Iron Dome. Uh, you and the House have gotten a lot done, and it has been obstructed by Republicans in the Senate. Um, uh, so she mentions the holding up of ambassadors and State Department nominees, including the U.S. Special Envoy to Combat and Monitor Anti-Semitism, Deborah Lipset, still waiting for a vote, um, uh, holding up the attorneys general, holding up federal nominees to prevent addressing inflation. Uh, we had we had this issue this week. Um, you know how how can Democrats get past this obstruction to actually have make some you know do do things legislatively to pass bills, to have progress. Um, and please also let us know what progress has been made in the past year, because th this is also uh, kind of been one of the difficulties in terms of democratic messaging. Well, I, you know, it's hard for me to weed into the filibuster conversation because that's a Senate issue and I'm in the House. I, I do think we need to get rid of the filibuster or at least place much more serious restrictions on the use of the filibuster. But quite frankly, that's not going to happen until we elect at least two more Democratic senators. It's just not going to. Um, so we really right now have to focus, as difficult as it is, we have to focus on doing a lot of deal making. Some of the people who have been, I mean, you're probably aware right now because of the news reports of Sarah Bloom Raskin's um, nomination to be part of the Federal Reserve Board. She's Jamie Raskin's um, wife and unbelievably qualified. And they're just stonewalling her uh, be mostly because of her positions on climate change and how it affects Federal Reserve risk and that kind of thing. But if it weren't her, it would be somebody else. Every, you know, there's somebody new every single day that's being held up. And this has gone beyond the case of simple differences on whether a person's qualified or not. It's truly, I mean, the, it, every goal is to obstruct the Biden administration from moving forward. And the effect quite honestly on foreign policy has been devastating. Um, we don't have ambassadors in a number of key countries that we really need to have ambassadors in. So I don't have any easy answers for how we, how we break that log jam. Uh, over the rest of the year. All I know, and it, it, this is such an unsatisfying answer, but I'm asked this all the time. And the answer I come up with is we need to elect more Democrats. And we have to because, the, you know, it's, it's kind of a, um, it, it gets said all the time and it sounds trite, but honestly, the Democrats are the party of policy and, and trying to make good things happen or at least make things happen and the republicans have turned into the party of no they literally talk about how government should be destroyed and then want to be elected so that they can destroy government and we i think hopefully we've seen and i'm getting a little far afield here but hopefully we've seen and that the american people have seen during covid that there's actually a role for good government um if we didn't have uh, the federal government in place all of the relief that was sent out during COVID would never have happened. And so there's just, there are no easy answers, but I just have to urge people not to lose hope, not to lose enthusiasm. I, I have this discussion on almost a daily basis with some sort of disillusioned Democrat in my district. I'm not saying the same one every day, different people who are like, eh, what have I gotten after you know Biden got elected? And then I literally have a checklist of things that I tell them that we they've gotten, that we've gotten. Um, and it, it's just, but it's a slog and it's going to be really hard this year. And it's gonna require 
lots of really, really good messaging. And I don't mean national messaging. I mean, there, there it would be nice to have some decent national messaging too, but it is going to mean that everybody in a district like mine is going to have to have that checklist of this is what we've done for you in the past two years um, and just reinforce it constantly. But I don't have any special tricks for breaking the filibuster. Sorry. Um, I'm going to ask you, actually, you gave me the perfect lead in um, about your district. You know, many people in this call are some are not from Pennsylvania. Many are not from your district. I always consider myself your neighbor to the south, really one over from you. But could you tell us about your district? Who lives in your district? What areas, geographic areas encompass? What is the socioeconomic makeup of your district? So the district is primarily the, what we think of as the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton. Um, I don't know, for people who are out of state, um, the Billy Joel song Allentown was really about Bethlehem, but I guess it didn't rhyme as well. Um, so it's a an area, quite honestly, I moved there in the 80s, and I would describe it back in the 80s as being a very white bread district, um, middle, primarily middle class Caucasians. We also have, um, well, I'll get to that in a second, but it, it was pr primarily a working class district for generations. Bethlehem Steel was there until they went out of business. Mack Trucks was there until they were moved south to a right to work state. Thankfully, Mack Trucks has come back to our district. Um, but it's it was a manufacturing district, but like the heavy duty kind of manufacturing, like steel and trucks and that kind of thing. What it's evolved into is a district that the primary um, economic drivers are the healthcare systems. We have two outstanding hospital networks that are collectively the largest employer in our district. Um, and then we have advanced manufacturing, computer chips, semiconductors, all those kinds of things, medical devices. And so that's sort of the lifeblood. So, you know, when I'm talking back in my district, I talk about manufacturing, I talk about trade, I talk about semiconductors, all those things, supply chain issues, those kinds of things are really important. That's on the employment side. But on the individual side, we still have people who literally are living paycheck to paycheck. And um, we have a lot of them. Uh, and until COVID hit and all of a sudden, we, workers started demanding better wages if they wanted if an employer wanted them to come back to work. Until that, we had an awful lot of people in my district who were literally earning $7.25 an hour, which is still sadly the Pennsylvania minimum wage. When I ran in 2018, we were all talking about $15 an hour, like it was some great thing. Well, now, fortunately, because of the worker shortage, there are very few people in, in my district who are not making at least $15 an hour. Um, so that's actually a positive. But, but just getting back to the composition of the district, as I said, it was not at all diverse as far back as the 80s. But because of the manufacturing sector, because of the healthcare networks, and because we are home to six colleges and universities plus two, plus two community colleges, but that doesn't enter into this conversation right now, the area has become significantly more diverse because what's happened is those employment sectors have cause people to move into our district from other states, which has been wonderful. As somebody who moved there in the mid eighties, I will tell you that it's so much more habitable and interesting and full of cultural attractions that we quite honestly did not have when I first moved to the area. And so um, the, because of that, by the way, I think that politicians overall have neglected to incorporate these more diverse parts of our district into their strategy, into their campaign plan. And that's what I set out to do in 2018 and did it successfully. So it is gradually evolving into a higher educated, slightly better off district. This, but this will is not the main line of Philadelphia. This is not a wealthy district by any means. Um, for, I'll just give you an idea. I have very few max out donors who are from my district. Max out donors to me generally are from outside the district because it, there just isn't that much money. Um, and it's, 
but it, it's changing in a very, very positive kind of way. That's great. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Haley. Well, just in closing, this is really more of a comment, I'm trying to get to as many as, as possible. Uh, Bert Siegel had something to share. Uh, it's a reflection on Barney Frank, who said, it's not enough to simply elect candidates who happen to be Jewish people, but who view their role as public servants and see that role through their Jewish hearts and souls. Susan, you epitomize that and in many ways represent all of us who think Jewish values inform good, compassionate government. So a thank you from Bert for exuding our Jewish values in Congress. So Bert, let me just say thank you for providing me with that quote. I'm going to look it up because that's a much better answer to the question that I <laughs> answered in a very roundabout way. But Barney Frank put it very well. And now I'm going to find that quote and use it regularly. Bert will send it to you, I am sure. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Bert, you're on mute if you're talking. Yeah, Bert's muted. Okay. I said, actually, I don't know if you're going to find it any place because Barney and I went to high school together, Bayonne High School in Bayonne, New Jersey. And I stayed in touch with Barney when he was in the house and he mentioned that to me. But you, you probably won't, but you could attribute it to me attributing it to Barney. Can you, can you, e can you email that to me, please? Sure, sure, happy to do <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, um, Bert. Thank you, everybody, for attending this Zoom. I want to especially thank um, Kelly Soifer for um, filling in at the last minute for Steve Sheffy. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Kelly, you should be. Um, she's CEO of JDCA. Please go check them out. Um, they're doing really good work, and they are going to have a lobby day in May that we hope all of you DJO people are a part of, and we'll be doing phone banking with them as we lead up to the election. I want to thank Dana um, for being here without her partner, but not her husband, <laughs> Steve Sheffy. Many people think they're married, they're not. Uh, and I want to thank everyone on behalf of DJOP. Um, Bert is the vice chair of our organization. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here and supportive of Susan Wilde, who is in a very tight race. There are very few competitive races across the nation because of the way of gerrymandering, um, but Susan's is one of them. Please donate to her generously and donate of your time if you can. Um, and she is one of DGOP's endorsed candidates. And if you live in the district, you better be voting for her. So, <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it, everybody. Dana, please tell Steve I'm thinking of him and all of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support and just for being here. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, and he appreciates your sympathies. Thank right. you, everybody, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.